it's Sarah here, one of the team from VJC Health. Thank you so much for all of your support in viewing and commenting on the content that we share on our channel. I'm really looking forward to sharing today's presentation. So it's all about gout. So we've got two rheumatologists busting myths and seeking the truth when it comes to the diagnosis and management of gout. So enjoy the topic. This is part one of the presentation. So if you uh, finish part one and you'd like to watch part two, then please consider uh, logging into BJC Connect where part two is available for you to watch. Uh, enjoy. Uh, my name is Erwin Lim. I'm the medical director of BJC Health. And I'm uh, again, warmly wishing you uh, a, th that you have a good night with us. And I'm thank you for joining us. Uh, let me introduce our speaker, who is Adam Mondrell. Uh, Adam's a rheumatologist who joined BJC in April. Uh, he's um, been a lovely addition to the team, uh, having done a lot of his work in Tasmania and also around Barrel, but he's uh, kind of consolidating at Parramatta. Uh, Adam has a particular interest of gout, which is why he's giving tonight's talk. So uh, over to you, Adam, and uh, I'll let you start. Thanks, Owen, and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining tonight. So um, tonight I'm going to give a bit of a, just a quick rundown of what gout actually is. And then really I'm going to go through and, and try and bust a lot of myths. Uh, I think all rheumatologists find there's a lot of misinformation out there about gout. There's a lot of, yeah, wrong information given to people and, and patients are always coming in with the same false facts, I suppose, about gout. So I'm just going to try and talk about those so that... Uh, we can all be on the, on the same page. So what is gout, first of all? So this is the, the classic textbook looking uh, joint that's affected by gout. That's the big toe. When it gets really painful, red, swollen, might feel hot as well. Now, the thing with gout is it can affect any joint. Uh, but the, the critical thing is it's always uh, very, very painful. Now, I've treated people that are like young footballers admitted to hospital in tears because they can't put any weight on their joints. It's, it's, it's really painful. And even if you don't treat it, usually it will settle down and go away on its own within a few weeks, anywhere from one to three weeks. And then you're left fine, wondering what on earth just happened. For some people, that might be it. Another time, other people might happen in a week or a month or in a year. Uh, but the critical thing is in between these episodes, people feel fine. Uh, as I said, it can affect any joint. This is someone else I saw that affected their wrist ne nearly anywhere in the body, not, not quite everywhere. So underlying this, what it is, is it's due to a buildup of uric acid. Now, uric acid is just a breakdown product from things we eat and drink. And for some people, the level gets high enough in the blood that it starts to deposit in joints and tendons. And then intermittently, it can trigger that acute inflammation that causes the, the pain and the swelling and the redness. So now we'll go through some of the, the myths that I commonly hear from people. The first one is my gout was diagnosed on a blood test. Now that is uh, completely wrong. It can't be diagnosed on a blood test. And the reason for that is, First of all, lots of people have high levels of uric acid in the blood. It does not mean you necessarily have or will get gout. Um, we don't know why some people with high levels of uric acid go on to get gout and others don't, but nevertheless, that's what we see. The other thing is during an acute flare-up of gout, the uric acid level on the blood test can be falsely low or, or in the normal range. And so sometimes people have, have an episode of gout, have a blood test, the uric acid level is normal, uh, but that's actually a false, false time to check. So it's not an accurate way to, to diagnose. The only way you can know 100% if someone has gout is to actually take some fluid out of the joint when it's affected. So when it's swollen and painful, and, that, and that's an easier process and less painful process than it sounds, but to take some fluid out and look at the fluid under a microscope in the lab and look for the uric acid. So that's what we're seeing here in this. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but the, the blue and the yellow is the, the uric acid crystals uh, that lo literally looks like that, all colourful and, and nice, <laughs> under the microscope. And that, that's how we make the diagnosis. Now, sometimes it's in a joint that's too small. Like the big toe is often too small to put a needle into to get fluid out. Or sometimes you can't uh, get to the joint or, or when someone has a flare-up. So I always tell my patients, if you have a flare-up, just call me. 
or email me and we'll, we'll book you in. I'll see you that day, definitely, to get the fluid out. But sometimes for logistical reasons, it's just not possible to do that. And thankfully, in, in the last few years, uh, we've got this new technology called a dual energy CT. Now, it's not a standard CT, so it's not available everywhere. Um, but in Parramatta, there is one in Parramatta where, where we're working. But uh, the dual energy CT helps to look for uric acid. And the great thing is, uh, it's the most simple test to look at because basically you're looking for bright green. So when you look at this scan here, uh, obviously there's lots of purple, which is just normal calcification around the joint. But the bright green that you can see around the knee, that is the uric acid. And, that, and that's another way we can make the diagnosis. It's not a perfect test, okay, because it doesn't always find the uric acid level. So up to 20% of the time in someone who has gout, we won't see it on the dual energy CT. So basically a positive scan confirms the diagnosis, but a negative scan doesn't necessarily rule it out. But it is a helpful thing if, if you can't actually get a needle into the joint. The second thing I often hear is, well, why bother treating? It won't do any harm if I don't treat it. But that's not really true. Um, so why do we treat it? First of all, it causes a lot of pain. I, I'm a wuss with pain. I hate it. I don't know why I have it, you know, if you didn't have to. And the, the good thing with gout is we can treat it. We can prevent it. So why put up with episodes of horrible pain if you don't actually have to? The other thing is we know that, you know, people that are having repeated flares of gout, it impairs their function. It reduces their participation at work. And again, this is all preventable. So we don't have to go through that. Gout also has an association with high blood pressure and with diabetes, heart disease, kidney disease, and obesity. And, you know, these are things that obviously affect people's uh, lifespans. And so it's important to control all, all associated factors. One of those is gout. Now, I've got a couple of photos coming up. The next one's not too bad, but the one after is a little bit graphic. So if you're a little bit squeamish, I'll just give you your, your 10 second warning now. <laughs> so if we don't treat gout, if the uric acid builds up enough, you can get what we call tophi. So these are just really visible, essentially lumps of uric acid that build up on joints. Now, not every lump you see on your joint is, is gout, okay? It's not a, a tophus. If we look at this bottom right-hand corner, you can see the lumps have this white in it. And that's really classic for, for a gouty tophus. Um, so that, that's you know, very obvious when that's gout. You can see that in this elbow as well in the top right corner. The pictures on the left side, you can't see it as clearly, but these are gouty lumps as well. So again, this is preventable. Um, those, obviously just the appearance, some people don't care, some people it bothers them, but also they get in the way. They get in the way of your function. So uh, again, preventable if we treat gout. The other reason to treat is if we don't, it's not just about causing pain, but with time, the inflammation from the gout can cause damage to the bones and the, and the joints. Oop. And I've gone one step ahead. I'll go to there next because I was talking about that. So what we can see in the x-rays is on the, the arrows, it's pointing to erosion. So essentially where the inflammation has e eaten little holes in the, in the bones. Now, unfortunately, if that happens, we can't undo it. We can't grow that bone back. So once that happens, it's there. And again, it is entirely preventable if we treat the gap properly we can prevent any of this damage being done. So that's an important thing because that with time, if it progresses enough, can start to cause uh, deformity in the joints and, and pain in the joints. So we want to prevent that. Go ahead, Adam, Adam, I might stop you and, and ask, uh, just take a little bit of a pause. Anyone yeah. who needs questions, please fill it in. But I might ask one as, a, as the person uh, kind of moderating this tonight. Um, you, you gave us a list of reasons why you would treat gout. But, uh, you know, many of the patients who come to see me, they, they might say, well, actually, I only have gout two or three times a year. I take, you know, one or two weeks of in the sit, sometimes even two, three days, and I'm fine. You know, do I really need to take a medicine, you know, long term? Uh, you know, what, what's your rationale there? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the guidelines suggest if you're having more than one flare ever, that you should go into treatment. And I think, again, um, even every attack theoretically can cause small amounts of damage. Now, you're not going to get erosions like this after one or two flare-ups. But if you add that up over many years, there is the risk for this to happen. I saw a patient today who told me he'd had six flare-ups of gout. Now, I think that's underestimating his flare-ups. 
But when we did x-rays, he's got significant erosions in his um, feet through multiple joints. So it's something that for him hasn't been that big a deal. Mm. He hasn't had that many flare-ups, but it's definitely caused damage there. So I think, I think that's a big reason to be yep. treated. You, you've also shown us a lot of pictures of, you know, tophaceous gout, which is obviously the worst kind yep. of form of gout. Um, I, I suppose when you see someone with that type of gout, do you bother with the aspiration or the dual energy CT or you're just going to treat? If someone has a clear tophus where you can see the white, I, I don't necessarily mm -hmm. because I think you don't need to. Uh, <clears throat> if I'm injecting a joint as part of treatment to try and settle down some inflammation, of course, I will send off fluid. But otherwise, no, I don't do that. Uh, again, this man today that I'm talking about, he had a, a lump, a bony lump uh, on his foot. I did do a dual energy CT to see if that was gout or if it was just a, just a bone growth unrelated to gout because that does impact our treatment. And I'm going to talk about that later on. Uh, but I, I did do a dual energy CT in that. I would do a dual energy CT in that scene. Okay. Any questions before I let uh, Adam continue? Doesn't look like it. Adam, I'll hand back to you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so the next uh, thing I often hear from people is I can't cure this. And that's uh, completely uh, wrong. There are many things in medicine that are challenging, like this photo, and a lot of people make gout look as challenging as this photo. But in reality, gout is the most straightforward thing I think we treat as rheumatologists. And it's the one thing that, as a rheumatologist, I can honestly tell a patient, I can genuinely stop you having these episodes. I can genuinely improve your quality of life and guarantee it pretty much. It's a lovely thing to be able to say as a doctor. I'm sure it's a lovely thing to be able to hear as a patient. It's definitely treatable and it is straightforward to do. So what does treatment involve? I always split the treatment of gout into two broad categories. So first there's the treating of the acute flare-ups of gout. And second, we want to prevent the flare-ups ever happening in the first place. So to treat the acute flare-ups, um, you can use anti-inflammatories, so things like Voltaren or Nurofen, Mobic, or Colchicine, which is uh, brand names for that are Colgout or Lengout. These are pretty mild sort of medications and tend to only work for milder flare-ups. If you have a really bad flare-up of gout, you often need to have something a bit stronger. And in that setting, we'll use prednisolone, which some people call cortisone or, you know, it's a steroid essentially. Now, this is a drug you can either, from a rheumatologist, have an injection into a joint if it's flared up or you can have tablets of it. It's not a drug you want to just be on forever because uh, it can affect your, your bone strength. It can affect your sugar levels and your weight. So it's only a drug we would ever use in, in short um, time frames usually for those reasons but at the end of the day those drugs just treat the acute flare-up they don't prevent them happening in the first place so to prevent the flare-up the, the main drug we use and, and maybe you've all heard of this one but that's allopurinol and the brand names for that are progout or xyloprin some people have a reaction to that and need to use something else so another drug is the buxostat and a less common one on top of that is called probenicid. So these are the drugs that are going to lower the uric acid level and prevent the flare-ups ever happening in the first place. So there you have it. That was part one of our GAT Mythbusters presentation. If you'd like to watch part two, then please log into BJC Connect. It's free. And then you can uh, watch the end of the presentation if it's of interest to you. Um, otherwise, please subscribe to our channel, like this presentation, and we we'll look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you.